Are we alone? I suspect we are not alone, but of course I'm not completely sure. Uh, I think the probability that we are uh, completely alone uh, in any way, shape, or form of what we mean by that is unlikely. Well, when I asked you the question, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? So we, I take uh, as a human, and as human, I'm a form of life that's complex. So when you say we are alone, I mean one of two things. Is there life out there? And then I ask the next question, is there some form of intelligent life out there? So to me, there's two things I'm thinking about. Are we humans alone on Earth? Are we humans alone on Earth? I think we are the only intelligent, uh, highly cognitive species on Earth, probably the only one that we've ever had. Uh, but of course, I feel very uh, accompanied by my, my dogs, my two Labradors, so I don't feel alone. Okay, now you said you, you suspect that we're not alone. Now, why do you suspect that? I suspect because I have a certain sense even though we're a one-off experiment of the probabilities of us coming in existence in Earth. We, some forms of life emerged very, very early on, work done here at ANU, you know, 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago, life emerged. Uh, and it's hard for me to imagine that that is a one-off, that there is no place in this incredibly vast universe, even the visible universe, which is finite, that that would be a one-off uh, occurrence given the 10 to the 26 planets or whatever exist in that volume. Now we're speaking English. Do you think there are aliens who speak English? I would guess that uh, within the finite volume of the visible universe, no way. But do you uh, think that there might be life within the finite volume of the visible I think universe? it's highly likely there'll be life and even complex life. So you think life is more is less quirky than English? I would say life is less quirky than English, yes. Okay, now, is this question, are we alone, an important question? Does it matter? What do you think? Probably doesn't matter for making your newest iPhone, but then it, again it does because it's such a question that is universal around the human psyche. I mean, I don't think my Labradors think about are we alone, but I think we as humans do, and I think humans 10,000 years ago did think about this. And I think that every human on planet Earth thinks about it a little bit. So it's a very universal condition of being human is to wonder, are we alone? Well, I, when I talk to academics and astrobiologists, they say, oh, yes, yeah, it's an important question. But when I talk to other people who, they said, no, this is a silly question. I don't want to think about it, and I'm not interested. So uh, I also get that. that re re so I think if you ask a 10 or 11-year-old, they care about it. Yeah. If you ask the same people, imagine I suddenly put in front an alien life form in front of you and you got to talk to, they'd care about it. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, the idea of wondering whether you're alone is trying to figure out, the, I guess, the scientific story of Genesis and how we got here. Is, uh, if you do that, if you study that, does that make, do you need to study that? And if you do, does that make you better somehow? Some people, I think it was Socrates who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So if you, if you don't care about this question, is your life not worth living? Or is it an important question to you personally? I think it's certainly an important question to me personally. I do think it is a question that most children do worry about, and it is sort of beaten out of them as unimportant as they get older. Mm -hmm. Do I think if you're not concerned about it? Well, I worry that maybe your life's a little empty. What do you worry about uh, would be my question. But I could imagine them just not being interested. That's OK. Uh, but to dismiss it as uninteresting, well, then I would say you truly are an uninspired, probably not very interesting person yourself. Well, is this the most important question you've ever heard? And if not, what are, what are the most important questions? So it is an important question uh, to what it means to be human. Is it the most important? <clears throat> well, it's the most important of a certain type of question. Well, what but is the most important? Uh, there is not a most important question. <laughs> Am I going to live for another second? You know, that's a very important question. Yes, yes. Um, or is lightning? So there is no important question, most important question. It is an important question to me. I care about this because I care about what it means to be human. I don't live life mechanically day to day. I try to think about what it means to be human. That gives me purpose. It gives me 
some sort of dignity. It gives me some sort of desire to keep going on. What part of your research is most relevant to trying to answer the question, are we alone? So I'm most known for being a cosmologist, uh, so studying essentially the size, scale, and age of the universe. So that is clearly an important part. But I also work uh, more recently on looking for planet, nearby planets, which you could imagine going through, looking at their atmospheres, and seeing whether or not uh, there are signs of life or civilizations revealed by those nearby planets. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat you have to spend this to try to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? For me, I think the best thing to do is to build really big telescopes to look very, very accurately at the atmospheres of nearby planets. That's the place where I feel that we can make amazing uh, progress very quickly. Not so, space telescopes? Well, so a very large telescope, ideally in space, because uh, it just makes everything easier. But you'd have to do the cost benefit between building a large telescope in space, very expensive, versus building a super huge set of telescopes on Earth. So my gut feeling is you'd probably be better off, probably if you want to just look for the signs of life on the ground, if you want to be more sophisticated than in space, but your chances of discovering something there are probably lower. No money for SETI? Uh, no, I'd spend some money on SETI, but not a lot of the $100 uh, billion. Dollars. I'd probably spend a billion on it. It's no, worthwhile. No money for <clears throat> microscopes to look for nano-aliens? Going out and looking for uh, nano-aliens that have uh, infiltrated our, our Earth, I think it's an interesting idea. It's something that uh, I think has been, I, I would guess most has probably been done, that can easily be done, <laughs> but you know, okay. I, I'm, I'm easy. Good, I think good. there are, let a thousand flowers bloom. Okay, good. <clears throat> That's the most positive response to that question I've had. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Where is everybody? My, my gut feeling is that uh, probably the solution is no one has managed to go interstellar in the galaxy. No one has managed to go interstellar. Well, we're just about to do that. Phil Lubin and Starshot, I mean, with lasers and postage stamps. Yeah, we haven't got our DNA there yet. No, but that's only in maybe a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or even a million years. That would still be small potatoes. I, I agree, but it may be hard. It may be hard. And we may um, be quite rare. So you're not, you don't believe that all civilizations kill themselves, and that would be this one solution. You just think it's the hard solution. Not only hard, well, it's, it has to be impossible, right? I think all civilizations have a finite lifetime, which is probably not sufficient to go interstellar. And we may be the first. I don't know. Okay. So, so I mean, that's my best guess. All right. What kind of aliens would you like to find? If you just friendly ones. Friendly ones. Nice ones. Okay. Uh, ones that don't scare me. Ones that don't kill me. <laughs> uh huh. So you don't. Ones be... that can communicate with me, like the ones in the movies who can always talk English. <laughs> They'd be great. You want to find an alien? Okay, Hollywood aliens. Okay. Now, some people think that if we found microbes on Mars and we could show that they had a, 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 an independent origin from life on Earth, that they would still be alone because because of the sentiment you just said. They said, hey, "I want to talk to aliens," and if you can't talk to them, well, I'm still. We're still alone. Well, uh, I earlier said that are you alone is two bits, life and then sentient beings not dissimilar to our eyes. So clearly discovering microbes on Mars or you know one of the other moons uh, around the solar system that might have it, that's a big step forward, huge. But it doesn't then take away the other half of are we alone. It remains a very interesting but probably much harder question to answer. Okay, and uh, have you ever seen an alien? I have never seen an alien. Have you ever been abducted by an alien? Uh, I have never been abducted uh, abducted by an alien. I haven't been probed by an alien. Okay, as far as you know. Uh, uh, as far as I know. <laughs> now, sometimes you've talked about imposter syndrome. It's like, wow, what, how did I get here? I don't belong here. So that, uh, that, that leads me to ask you, are you an alien? Uh, I do not believe I am an alien, except for the purposes that I am a U.S. citizen living in Australia. <laughs> okay. So that is one form of being an alien. Okay. What do you think of multiverse ideas? Uh, what do the ideas of the multiverse have to do with aliens? Anything? Like, so, I mean, the, the idea of a multiverse gives you uh, a quasi-infinite number of possibilities. 
um, so that life becomes essentially inevitable given the scale of uh, what's out there and possible. So I think in that way they intersect with the idea of uh, are we alone, but in another sense they don't because that part of the universe is manifestly completely disconnected from us forever. And if it's always disconnected, even if there's something there and there's no way to know about it, it's a very metaphysical issue, I guess. All right. And uh, in, in our universe, or beyond the observable universe, what do you think are the things that could vary or change? Big G or the speed of light? I mean, how very When they talk about the multiverse, they, it comes along with the idea of, oh, these big important things could vary. What do you think of those things? Do you have any... So the idea of the fundamental you know, uh, constituents, how the actual fabric of the universe is put together. Uh, in the multiverse is that often one of the things that changes. Uh, but we don't have a particularly good theory that underpins this. I mean, is string theory correct? Maybe. Uh, and under string, does theory, string theory make a prediction about the differences in the mass of the electron to the proton mass? Well, it su suggests that they're drawn from 10 to the 500 different well, that you know, vacuum, combinations right? of that. So, you know, I think the, the question comes down, you know, to we do not have an adequate theoretical framework uh, for me to honestly answer the question. I think it is absolutely possible. It strikes me as being reasonable in a metaphysical way, but I have no way of actually saying, yeah, that's it, it's for sure true. Well, how about dark energy, this lambda? Uh could, what might it be that aliens have something to do with that? We're looking for aliens, and there it is staring us in the face. 70% of the energy density of the universe is aliens, and they've figured out how to make vacuum energy look like noise, but it's really an organized uh, thing that uh, the aliens are dark so, energy. So, but, so now we're getting into the question, are we living in the matrix? Are we part of a giant simulation? That's uh, another question, yes, yes. Right? So well, I, would, I would say those are metaphysical. So the answer is... We might be. I don't think it's likely, uh -huh. uh, but I can't. I'm not, I'm not going to say that's not right because I don't. I have to have perfect knowledge. I think it's highly unlikely, mm -hmm. but I can't say no. But I don't wake up and worry at night about it. Maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, I would say it's sufficiently non-probable <laughs> that it doesn't matter. When I asked an Indian student about uh, if I give you a hundred billion dollars to help answer the question, are we alone? He said something like. Well, I'd invested in poverty reduction programs. And I said, why would you do that? And he said, well, because the human inequality is going to lead us to war and we're going to kill ourselves. And in order to find aliens, you have to be alive. You have to stay alive. And so you said telescope. So you think staying alive is a given? No, I actually don't think it's a given. Um, I just don't think $100 billion <laughs> even starts to touch, the scratch the surface of what needs to be done on human inequality. $100 trillion, which would be... <laughs> what takes, then we'd be talking on that I front. See. No, but he's he's absolutely right. That's probably one of the going to be the most foundational issues about whether we determine if we're alone is if we stay as human civilization on the planet long enough. Now, Lawrence Krauss has said that we are a cosmic accident, and uh, what does that mean? Are we a cosmic accident because of the particular way the Higgs field froze, or what? What could it have frozen in a different way? So I think he's getting down there, uh, Lawrence should speak for himself, uh, about how the universe emerged, uh, at least our version of the universe emerged, from what might be multiverses or might just be our own. And underpinning that is a notion of some sort of grand theory, string theory, or some other theory, where these constants of nature are put together in a way, and of course they have to be put in a way in which we could emerge as a, a sentient being to even ask the question. So that might be an accident, might not. Again, I do not know and understand uh, the basic creation of the universe well enough to do anything other than to guess in a metaphysical sense. And as a scientist, I really don't like doing that. I could also say God created us and made us so equally you know, valuable quite frankly, to the, to the conversation. Well, some scientists, even good scientists, think that the universe has been fine-tuned. What, what do you think of those ideas? Uh, well, if you think it's been fine-tuned, uh, there's two ways to look at it. It's been fine-tuned by some 
you know, entity, being, whatever. A tumor. Well, I, I would say that's a very uh, strong statement compared to my sense of the universe. Some would say it's been fine-tuned is that there's an infinite number of universes to pick from, and we have emerged in the ones where we can emerge in, and there's fine-tuning that way. So entropic much more, selection. Yeah, so I'm much more comfortable with that notion. Doesn't mean it's true, uh, but I cannot re reject or accept either there I just don't know I it's it's questions where we do not have an adequate scientific tool set in my opinion to really answer at this point I think I think David Gross is somebody who'd like to calculate all this fine tuning so it doesn't seem like fine tuning so say, hey that's the way it had to be because of this calculation yeah. do you sympathize with are you in that camp at all Oh, I'd love for it to be, but that means you got to have to have the theory that underpins it all, the, the perfect version of string theory, which you can calculate all this, right. and you believe. Right. So we're not there yet. So, no, I think he's trying to do the right thing, but I don't think we're there yet. Well, some of your work and other work has led to the idea that the universe is spatially flat and therefore possibly spatially infinite. And if it's infinite, then anything with a then anything that can happen will happen an infinite number of times. So might there be an infinite number of Brian Schmitz in the universe? So it depends on what you think Brian Schmidt is. If you have this very vast universe that's quasi-infinite or infinite, you know, you do get a lot of chances for things to happen. Uh, but it may well be that Brian Schmidt is infinitely complex. That uh, Infinitely complex? Infinitely complex. <laughs> so complex. So it's set of measure zero. Set of, yes. So that when you try to multiply your two infinities, mm -hmm. it's undefined. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, it is that there is more than me. My guess is probably something very, very similar to me, but you know, we'll have different memories and all sorts of other things. That, that level of complexity, to my mind, is probably so high not to be replicated. But Do there will be things that look an awful lot like me in such a universe. <laughs> okay. Do you have any emotional attachment to one view or the other? You wish you were the only one, or you wish there were you all over the place? Uh, I, li I, I guess I'd prefer to be the only one, um, <laughs> noting again, they're not going to have my consciousness, they're going to have a different set of life, it, it's, mm. it would be very difficult for it to have, it's not like they're going to have my identity, they're just like an identical twin at some mm. point. So, so, you uh, said so that there'll be someone who's like an identical twin level of copy, that I think probably would happen, but it doesn't mean your identical twin is you. So. When I asked you about an infinite number of Brian Schmitz, you invoked, I don't know, some very large degree of complexity, which would be maybe consistent with you being a set of measure zero. Why couldn't you use those same, that same logic to talk about life and say that life itself is a set of measure zero and this is the only place where we see this particular type of thing? Well, there is a chance of it. Uh, the problem is that the Earth was formed and life existed, and if you look at the total complexity of the earliest forms of life, I would say that's finite, it's chemistry. It's not like they have a set of neurons and things. It really is a fairly fundamental piece of chemistry that uh, does not have infinite complexity. You could imagine with sufficient skill creating life if you know what you were doing. Now, we haven't been able to do that yet, so my sense is it's probably not infinitely complex. But once you get to someone's psyche and their memories and total lived experience, it starts becoming, um, as I said, that becomes the next level of complexity. In the same way that a, you know, a single bacteria has a quite a simple uh, life, but you know their actual life experience involves, you know, everything from quantum fluctuations to all the infinite number of interaction. Their, quasi-infinite number of interactions that take a quasi-infinite or possibly even infinite you know, form of the degrees of freedom that they have. So to me it is different. But you are an animal? Are you an animal? Uh, I believe I'm an animal, yes. So if we <clears throat> believe that life evolved on this planet over four billion years and you know, I could ask you the same question you just said to about a human being, I could ask you about a chimpanzee, I could ask you yep. about gorillas, I could ask you about worms, I could ask you, et cetera. So there seems to be in Darwinian theory a, a continuum from what you considered finite complexity and therefore uh, not set of measure zero to you or a human being. Somehow there, y you have assumed that you've gone over some threshold to go from zero, 
epsilon to a set of measure zero? That well, seems like a difficult threshold. Well, I, so I actually would say even an individual simplest form of life will not have an exact copy anywhere in the universe. I would say even that and its experience makes it effectively infinitely complex. So I, I don't have, I don't think an issue there. So there you put the <clears throat> barrier between non-life and life. So that we also think is a very blurry thing because we believe that non -life Oh, I would say every rock, there's no rock. Oh. That's exactly the same. Okay, um, how about electron? I have an electron between here and here. Electrons are fundamental particles. And so then I would say... No, but the position of the electron. Uh, again, I would say that the position of the electron probably... I need to calculate that. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. So uh, now one question that we're interested in is whether if we replayed the tape of life, anything like humans would re-evolve. Uh, so in other words, is, is human-like intelligence a convergent feature of evolution? When I talk to biologists, they say, get out of here, that's a crazy question. Of course not. And, but most physicists think, oh, yes, of course, they do. For example, Carl Sagan thinks that the universe is filled of, of functionally equivalent humans. And yet or, or there's a famous debate between Ernst Meyer and Carl Sagan about this. And the biologist said, no way, you know, this type of thing only evolved once. And if we ever go extinct, we're not coming back. But Carl Sagan insisted, no, there are many ways to this type of intelligence. And so the universe should be filled with functionally equivalent humans. What do you think of that debate? Do you stand on one side or the other? Or are you just observing it? Or I would be an observer on that one. Uh, I do not understand well enough. Uh, I mean, I would be very surprised that we would be unique as humans uh, in our intelligence. I mean, I see our intelligence as being some sort of emergent quantity based on complexity of life here on Earth. Uh, is it clear to me that it is something you expect to emerge? Uh, no. Uh, my guess is it will emerge sometimes. It, it is a fairly useful, as humans have demonstrated on Earth, it's a very useful characteristic for, uh, you know, taking over an ecosystem. Uh, so in that sense, um, you're not going to be selected against having it. So I, I would say it's uh, not guaranteed, but I would expect, given enough length of time of complex life forms, you would expect inter intelligence of some form to emerge. Uh, I, uh, that seems likely to me. And so then the, the Fermi paradox becomes more compelling. If uh, it becomes more compelling, yes, because I would expect, I mean, it may be very rare that we come out. So, you know, there's only 10 to the 10 planets on um, in the Milky Way. So it's not at all obvious that it might be quite a rare phenomenon uh, for it to emerge. Okay. And what are the biggest misconceptions that you think people have about thinking about this question, are we alone? I think the universe is such a big place that the notion of there being intelligent life out there does not mean it inter overlaps with us in space and in time. So I think it's quite likely it's out there, but our ability to ever know that it's there, especially intelligent beings, which I would guess might be quite rare, uh, might be extraordinarily difficult, which is very difficult to connect up. Hmm. Um, so that was the biggest misconception. All right, now, um, I think people think if there's intelligent life out there, we should be able to find it. That's not at all obvious to me. Okay, now Arthur C. Clarke said that uh, any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indistinguishable from magic. And then there's a guy, uh, Carl Schroeder in Germany says, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. As if when you become really technological savvy, you learn how to recycle things in ways that you do not send out signals as, uh, like you don't pave, you don't cut down a, a forest to create a parking lot and then all kinds of things you, you send out to outer space. So um, do you agree with Arthur? Do you agree with this Carl Schroeder guy about uh, as we get more technologically sophisticated, do you think our signal will be harder to pick up if there are other people looking for SETI on other planets? Well, I think both are right in different limits. So if you get more and more advanced from us, uh, you're going to have technology and things which are well beyond what we understand. And if you even think right now, an iPhone to someone in the 17th century would have definitely got you probably put to the stake. Uh, it would have been magic. 
On the other hand, as you get more and more advanced, you tend to use less and less power. And if, for example, if you look at radio frequency communications now, they begin looking like noise uh, when they're broadcast because we're becoming more and more efficient. So in that sense, you end up, as you say, becoming low and low, more and more uh, low impact in most things. But if you want to flex your muscles, you probably can build the giant mega you know, spaceship. So I think the question is how far you let things evolve. Uh, if you're truly going to become sustainable forever, you definitely have to become effectively invisible. Um, or you can do it the other way and become really big and hop from star to star. No one's done that as near as we can tell in our galaxy with giant structures. So uh, I think like anything, the answer is uh, probably Arthur C. Clarke is, is certainly true, but it may well be that the fact that you start looking like nature is ultimately true if a civilization ever gets to that point, which is not at all guaranteed. Have you seen the movie Contact? Uh, you know, I actually have never seen the movie Contact. Well, in the movie Contact, uh, three times uh, somebody says, are we alone? And the answer comes from the scientist, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. What do you think of that comment? Uh, that's assuming, nah, so I don't ascribe any particular importance in a cosmic sense about uh, being uh, alive. I think we're there, it'll be kind of cool, but a waste of space, nah. Uh, <laughs> it's just the universe is the way it is, whether or not we fill it or not. In the movie, they get a signal from the aliens and uh, and then they start building this thing that with the instructions given by the aliens. And some of the military generals say, no, we shouldn't build this at all because uh, if we do, it'll just make destroy us or something. And uh, so it's a little bit of a paranoid vision of, of I guess, signaling with extraterrestrials. Uh, but Stephen Hawking has said, oh, no, we should never send signals out, but we should keep our heads down, I think, is what he said. Do you agree with that? We should keep our heads down to keep our presence uh, delayed, not, not let the aliens know that we're there as long as possible? Uh, this is always a challenging one. Um, my guess is that uh, it's quite likely there are no aliens that can travel interstellar to us. So in that sense, being able to broadcast to get a single back, say, hey, we're over here, but there's no way we're coming to visit you. It's not that bad. Um, it'll take you know, hundreds of years. That being said, if they really can travel interstellar, and I'm wrong on that thing, telling them we're here is probably a bad idea because I think the whole process of natural selection, which almost certainly would work on any life form, would make them bad dudes uh, like we are. Are we alone? Uh, I do not think. I mean, I think we are not alone. I think there's something out there somewhere, either life and almost certainly complex life, and why do you believe that? Uh, why do I believe it? Because the balance of probabilities. Uh, we live in a very, very large universe, and I just do not believe we are such a rare event uh, here on planet Earth.